Before the 1980s, Beethoven's Tenth Symphony was regarded as an elusive, legendary work that many people didn't believe had ever existed, except perhaps inside Beethoven's head. Over the years, it had acquired an aura of mystique, almost on the par with something like the Loch Ness Monster or Atlantis, and it had figured prominently in several fictional writings. No sketches had been identified with any certainty as belonging to it, and as recently as 1977, the eminent Beethoven scholar Robert Winter wrote, The sole possible verdict, beyond any reasonable doubt, is that Beethoven was completely innocent of having done any more than thought about a Tenth Symphony. Since then, however, two scholarly articles, one by Sieghard Brandenburg and one by me, have shown conclusively that a significant number of Beethoven's sketches from the period 1822 to 25 were intended for the Tenth Symphony. The evidence is incontrovertible. A letter from Beethoven, written only eight days before his death in 1827, mentioned a new symphony which lies already sketched in my desk. His friend Karl Holtz claimed to have heard Beethoven play the entire first movement of the Tenth Symphony on the piano. And Holtz was a generally reliable witness who was in very close contact with him during the last 18 months of Beethoven's life. So Beethoven had clearly made substantial progress on the work. Now, the newly identified sketches are clearly for a symphony, for they refer to horns, strings, woodwind, timpani, and end of the first movement. And on an adjacent page, there's a reference to the new symphony. Furthermore, they are later than the ninth symphony. But what really settles the issue is that the sketches in question match precisely Holtz's very unusual description of the movement he had heard a gentle introduction in E-flat major, followed by a powerful allegro in C minor. The discovery of these sketches has created the possibility of producing for the first time a performing version of at least one movement of the symphony, if not the whole work. Many other works left incomplete by a major composer have been finished by someone else, Berg's Lulu, Mahler's Tenth Symphony, and some unfinished symphonies by Schubert, for example. Mozart's Requiem is regularly performed, even though he left much of it incomplete at his death. Completing Beethoven's Tenth is actually much more complicated and difficult than any of these other works. Far less material survives altogether, and what does exist is very fragmentary. No fragment contains more than about 30 bars of continuous music. The harmony is often missing, and there are only occasional indications about orchestration but it is in fact possible to complete at least the first movement without wandering too far into the realms of fantasy. How useful it is to make such completions depends on several factors. Firstly, how significant is the work historically? If we had an unfinished symphony by, say, Johann Molter, I think we would hardly bother, since Molter wrote 170 other complete symphonies, all hardly ever performed. The Beethoven's nine are a cornerstone of the repertoire, and so a tenth is bound to be interesting. Secondly, did the composer himself intend to complete the work? After all, if even Beethoven hadn't found it completable or worth completing, it would be foolish for anyone else to try. But he clearly did intend to complete the Tenth Symphony, as he indicated in the letter written eight days before his death, and it was only his death that prevented him. Thirdly, how near is the symphony to completion already? If Beethoven had only written the first few notes, it would be absurd to try and complete the rest. But in fact, a close examination of the sketches shows that in the first movement, there is enough basic motivic material to complete the whole movement without the invention of any significant new themes or motifs. Fourthly, how accurately can the missing material be guessed? Not very accurately, perhaps. But if one has a sufficient knowledge of his musical style, and in particular, his customary composing methods, it should be possible to get fairly close to the sort of movement he had in mind. During my research for a book on Beethoven's creative process, I had already made a detailed study of his sketches and his composing methods in numerous other works, and I had worked out what his normal procedures were. So, by applying these procedures to the first movement of the Tenth Symphony, 
I felt I was in a better position than most people to attempt a completion. Fifthly, what is the quality of the surviving sketches? Are they worth completing? Well, in my view, they are extremely good, even by Beethoven's high standards. In fact, their quality was a major inducement for me to try and put them together into a complete movement. There were several benefits to be gained from making a completion of this first movement, provided that proper scholarly rigour is maintained. The result enables the general musical public, instead of just a handful of specialists, to obtain a rough impression of what Beethoven had in mind. It adds a new work, and one that should be of very good quality, to the existing orchestral repertoire. It enables us to assess much more accurately what proportion of the movement Beethoven actually sketched. It also throws new light on the sketches themselves and their interrelationships. And it enables us to hear the sketches in the context for which they were intended, rather than just as disembodied fragments. Ideas for the Tenth Symphony can be traced back in Beethoven's sketches to as early as 1812. At this date, he was composing two symphonies, as number seven and eight, and intending to write a third. Hence, amongst his sketches for the seventh and eighth are various ideas for other unrealized symphonies. Altogether, he made at least 11 such sketches for possible symphonies at this time. Three of the 11 are in D minor, foreshadowing the key of the Ninth Symphony. But the longest is in E flat major and anticipates the 10th. It headed Symphony 3, i.e. the third in the current group, and it includes ideas for all four movements. It begins ambiguously in E flat major or C minor, like this. With strong emphasis on the notes G and A flat. Notes that were to be very prominent in later sketches for the Tenth Symphony. In the next fragment is a soft lyrical theme, still in 2-4 time, and then further down the page, a motif similar to the one we've just heard. These sketches have several features in common with later ones for the Tenth Symphony. The keys, the 2-4 meter, the soft lyrical melody, the octave leap, and the emphasis on the notes G and A-flat. Near the bottom of the page are ideas for later movements. A minuet in C, probably C minor, an adagio in A-flat, and a fugal rondo in E-flat for the finale. Each of these movements contains an important idea that was to re-emerge in later sketches, although the actual themes don't reappear. Beethoven's plans to write a third symphony in the group seem to have evaporated by the end of 1812. He did occasionally have ideas for possible symphonies in the next few years, but when he began serious work on his next new symphony, around the end of 1815, it was on the D minor that became number nine. Then in 1817, he received a request from Ferdinand Ries to write two symphonies for the Philharmonic Society of London, and on the 9th of July, he replied, agreeing to do so. In another letter to Ries, dated 30th of January 1819, he implied that the symphonies were by then at least partially written. Rumours of the two symphonies reached as far as Breslau, for Franz Zaver Gebauer heard reports during a visit there in 1820 that Beethoven was working on two symphonies, and he asked Beethoven about them, as we know from Beethoven's conversation books. But sketches for the ninth are rare from this period, and ideas for a tenth even rarer. The only known one for the tenth occurs in a group of remarks on a loose sketch leaf of 1818. These remarks were discovered and published by Gustav Notterbohm many years ago and have since become quite well known. The sketch says, Adagio Cantique, pious song in a symphony in the ancient modes, Lord God, we praise thee, alleluia, either alone or as introduction to a fugue. Perhaps the whole second symphony characterised in this way, in which case the vocal parts enter in the last movement, or already in the adagio, or rather vague and indecisive. And the themes noted down by Beethoven on the same page have no connection with the Tenth Symphony 
as sketched a few years later. The first substantial sketches known for the Tenth Symphony date from about October 1822 and are in a sketchbook now in Berlin. They show an andante in E-flat, 2-4 metre, with a theme in which the first three bars are virtually identical to the middle movement of the Pathetique Sonata. followed by an allegro in C minor, 6-8, marked fortissimo, and then a return of the andante. At about the same time, Beethoven made more extensive sketches for the symphony on a loose bifolio now in Bonn. There are several sketches for the andante in E-flat and the C minor allegro on the first page, while on page two are brief ideas for later movements. These were originally labelled as the second, third and fourth movements, but Beethoven later changed the numbers to 3, 4 and 5. This suggests he decided to count the opening Andante and Allegro as two separate movements at this stage. The sketches for the third and fourth movements are only a few bars long, but the finale is more substantial. It consists of a melody in minuet rhythm totalling 36 bars, like this. This minuet theme, however, was later developed and used in a different work, known as the Gratulations Minuet, which was first performed on the 3rd of November 1822, so it was evidently withdrawn from the Tenth Symphony. Such a change of plan is quite common in Beethoven's sketches. The third main source for the symphony is confined to a single page in a sketchbook from early 1824, now in Vienna, written shortly after Beethoven had finished the Ninth Symphony. Here, the andante is sketched in C major, but with a note that it could be an E-flat after all. There is a brief introduction of about three bars, and then the andante theme appears. But it is slightly different from before, and no longer so close to the pathetic sonata. There's a completely new Allegro theme, apparently in C major, and then the Andante theme returns. It concludes with a perfect cadence and double bar, signifying the end of the movement. There's no indication of any later movements. In the last major source, a pocket sketchbook dating from about October 1825, the Andante has reverted to E-flat, and the C minor Allegro from the 1822 sketches has reappeared. There was also a brief idea in A-flat major that may have been intended as a slow movement theme, and a longer theme in C minor, 3-4, marked presto. Altogether, in the four main sources, plus the early one of 1812, there are around 350 bars of sketches for the symphony. About 250 are for the first movement, the rest are for possible later movements. Some bars either duplicate or even contradict others, but even if these are discounted, there still remains a sizable amount of material. The problems of establishing what each individual sketch signifies or implies in order to find out what sort of movement Beethoven had in mind so as to reproduce it as accurately as possible are extremely complex, and I can't go into much detail here. But a close scrutiny of each sketch in the light of similar sketches for other works, has led to many more conclusions than one might have expected. The sketches can be divided into five categories corresponding to five different parts of the work. The opening bars, the andante in E-flat, the allegro in C minor, the reprise of the andante, and the later movements. I'll take each in turn. First, the opening. Many of Beethoven's movements begin with some kind of opening gesture, often described as a curtain, before the main theme. There are at least three sketches that indicate he intended some such curtain before the Andante in the Tenth Symphony. The three are unfortunately very different from each other. A soaring figure in the 1812 sketch, a tentative, hesitant one in the 1824 sketch, 
which can't be properly deciphered, and a single horn chord in the 1825 sketch, like this. Of these, the most promising seems to be the figure in the 1812 sketch, even though it's the earliest. There is a pause on the chord before the andante theme in both of the other sketches, and so this pause can be combined with something derived from the 1812 sketch and the horn chord to form a concise but pregnant opening idea for the symphony, and one that has long-range implications for the rest of the movement. Something like this. It's worth noting that another movement in E-flat major begins with a rather similar idea. This is the finale of Beethoven's Opus 127 quartet, which begins like this. And then you get the theme. Next, the andante. The andante is dominated by unaccompanied woodwind, at least at the start. And one of the sketches states explicitly that it's in two parts. For Beethoven, this phrase normally meant that the movement was divided into two clear sections by a double bar and probably repeats. Thus, some kind of binary form was apparently intended. The approximate size of the andante is indicated by the fact that Beethoven was uncertain whether to count it as a separate movement. So a duration of something like four or five minutes would therefore seem about right. Longer than slow introductions, but shorter than an independent movement. For some years past, he had been developing the idea of blurring the distinction between a movement and a section, e.g. by linking movements together, or by writing substantial but incomplete sections. He tried this in several sonatas and quartets already, so it would be a logical step to try it in a symphony for the first time. If the andante is to last about four minutes, the composite first movement as a whole, andante, allegro, andante, should probably last nearly 15 minutes altogether. We might note that the first movements of both the 7th and 9th symphonies last about 13 minutes at Beethoven's prescribed speeds. Like many of Beethoven's preliminary sketches and other works, those of this andante are very plain in places. Listen to this phrase. a string of equal notes and a very basic cadence. It's typical of his sketches, but very untypical of his finished works, which are almost always more ornate. Similar cadences in other works can provide clues as to how this one would be meant to sound. The cadence at the middle of the Bagatelle, Opus 126, number 2, which is found in the same sketchbook as some of the Tenth Symphony sketches, makes a good comparison. In the early version of the sketch, the cadence was entirely conventional, But Beethoven then altered it to the final version, which is much more irregular and imaginative. Making similar alterations to the phrase I played from the Tenth Symphony, which went like this. Might therefore result in a final version, something like this. Comparable changes have to be made elsewhere in the Andante, where the music is too plain. And where there's more than one sketch for a single passage, it's normally best to adopt the most ornate one and or the latest one. This is what Beethoven himself usually does in his other works. Next, the Allegro. In the Allegro, the overall form is a continuous movement without any clear breaks. This is evident from the phrase Ohne zwei Teile not two parts, in one sketch. So the Allegro should have no central double bar or repeat sign. But the sketches contain several indications that it was to be in sonata form, like the first movement of all his other nine symphonies. Several versions of the opening Allegro theme exist, 
for example these. Or this. Or this. But I prefer one of those in the 1825 sketchbook, as it's one of the latest sketches and also the most ornate, and therefore probably closest to what would have been in the final version. This one. In one sketch, the main theme appears to be stated twice, with the two statements separated by other motifs. In many of Beethoven's other sonata form movements, the first subject also appears twice near the beginning, and so it seems fairly clear that some similar procedure was envisaged here. There are several ideas for extending the first subject by developing motifs in the main theme and introducing and developing a few more short motifs, as happens in his other symphonies. One notable feature in two of the attempts at continuation is the appearance of an unexpected C-sharp. This note seems to have long-range implications in the movement, for it reappears prominently at the start of the second subject in G minor. And it is also reminiscent of a D flat that occurred in the andante as the first chromatic note. The andante begins like this. And there's the D flat. There seems every likelihood that Beethoven would have exploited this note elsewhere in the movement, as he does with a similar C-sharp in the Eroica. There's the problematical C-sharp. If the first movement is to be about the same length as those of the 7th and 9th symphonies, as suggested earlier, the Allegro section needs to be about 400 bars long. Unfortunately, we don't have 400 bars of allegro sketches. However, if we assume a normal amount of phrase repetitions and recapitulations, such as occur in all Beethoven's sonata form movements, we can get nearly 200 bars of it. And there's more than enough basic thematic material to fill the remaining gaps by means of developments, extrapolations, and continuations of the material in the sketches. So, as I said earlier, no new themes have needed to be composed for my realisation. The main gaps I've had to fill in this way are small ones before and after the second subject and larger ones in the development and coda. Filling such gaps may seem terribly speculative, but actually I've had several things to guide me. Firstly, of course, I've had to keep within Beethoven's general style. Secondly, it's possible by studying his sketches for other works to follow what he did himself when filling in similar gaps elsewhere. Thirdly, only themes and motifs from the 10th Symphony sketches have been used as the basis for development. Fourth, each of these motifs can only be developed in certain ways. Fifth, many of the motifs contain features that call for particular types of development. And most important, the added passages must connect and balance with the existing ones so that the joins are invisible. And this is quite difficult to accomplish. Let's look briefly at the start of the development section to see how one of these gaps is filled. In my realisation, the curious C-sharp or D-flat heard earlier is reused at the start of the development, first of all as a single note. Something very similar happens in one of Beethoven's late bagatelles, at exactly the same place and with the corresponding note. At the start of a symphonic development, Beethoven usually takes the head motif of the main subject and repeats it in various forms, sometimes creating two large matching paragraphs before modulating to a remote key. So this is what I've done, using the head motif in close imitation, since it happens to work particularly well like this. The remote key that suggests itself is F-sharp minor. The C-sharp heard earlier makes a very good preparation for this key. 
And meanwhile, the F-sharp itself is, as it were, explained later, for it is the first note of the second subject in the recap. Like that. Incidentally, F-sharp minor is also the key used in the fifth symphony in exactly the corresponding place in the development. So, using procedures like this, and working along these lines, I've managed to fill in all the gaps in the Allegro. Next, the reprise of the Andante. The sketches indicate that the Allegro was to close in C minor, followed by a big chord in E flat major, and the return of the Andante. During this reprise, the strings were to continue with the 6-8 rhythm of the Allegro section as a kind of decoration to the Andante theme. What seems to be required, therefore, is a varied restatement of the Andante. Beethoven was, of course, very fond of variation in his later years. A useful precedent here is the first movement of the Piano Sonata Op. 27 No. 1. It's the companion of the Moonlight Sonata. I sometimes fancifully call it the Sunlight Sonata. This also has an andante in E flat. Then a 6 8 allegro in C, though major rather than minor as in the 10th symphony. Then a greatly abridged return of the andante and a coda. So in the symphony, the andante should probably return complete, but varied and without the repeats. It is then followed by an extended coda which there are several sketches. Altogether then, by assuming the usual restatements and corresponding bars, such as occur in Beethoven's other works, a melodic line has been produced for the whole of the opening andante and virtually the whole reprise of the andante. Only in the Allegro have there been major gaps to fill in. Finally, what of the later movements? Here we're much less well off although I have found sketches for no fewer than ten movements which have possible or definite connections with the symphony. None of them, however, is very extensive, and it's not clear which of them, if any, Beethoven intended to use. Apart from the sketch which became the Gratulations Menuet, the only other substantial sketch is the one for a presto and trio in C minor and C major. Even this is only about 32 bars long altogether, and so the sketch would form a much smaller proportion of the whole than in the first movement. In any way, a first movement plus a scherzo is much less satisfactory than just the first movement on its own. Hence, unless more sketches are found, any attempt at completion of the later movements is unlikely to be very effective. So this realisation of the first movement is perhaps about as close as we are likely to come to hearing Beethoven's Tenth Symphony itself. The realisation is obviously not as good as Beethoven would have done, and in certain places in particular I think he might have been more imaginative. But I have tried to keep close to the sketches to show what he had in mind at the time, rather than let my imagination run riot. And I think this realisation does give a reasonable impression of what would surely have been one of Beethoven's finest symphonic movements. <laughs>